With three games to go at the end of the 1992-93 Premier League season, Oldham Athletic appeared to be doomed. As Sheffield United hit form at just the right time to stand any chance of staying in the Premier League, in what was the league's first season following a breakaway from the Football League, Oldham would have to win every one of their remaining three games and hope that Crystal Palace picked up no more than one point from their last two matches. To make matters even worse for Oldham, their last three games would see them travel to Villa Park, with Aston Villa still in contention to pit Manchester United to the Premier League title, host Liverpool, and then face the challenge of fellow strugglers Southampton, who Oldham hadn't beaten in the league since the mid-1970s. A shock 1-0 win against Villa handed Manchester United the inaugural Premier League title, before a stunning 3-2 win against Liverpool suddenly turned survival for Oldham into a realistic prospect. On the final day of the season, as Crystal Palace were well beaten by Arsenal, Oldham played out an exhilarating seven-goal thriller against the Saints, emerging victorious by four goals to three. The Premier League had its first, and arguably still its greatest, great escape. But almost three decades on, as the Premier League gets ready to celebrate turning 30 years old, the team who Oldham condemned to Premier League relegation, Crystal Palace, are now approaching an uninterrupted decade of Premier League football. The Latics, meanwhile, are the lowest ranked out of all 92 teams within the Football League pyramid, and look almost certain to lose their EFL status this season, a status which they have retained for the last 115 years. When that seeming inevitability becomes a reality, Oldham will become the first team to have played in the Premier League to actually get relegated from the Football League entirely and to have dropped into the non-league game. There has been a lot of focus on the existential threat that is posed to Derby County in recent weeks and months. Quite rightly, of course. But in the form of Oldham Athletic, there is another former Premier League team, steeped in tradition, whose footballing downfall has been incredibly dramatic, and whose entire existence seems to be under immense threat right now. I have long been vaguely aware of some of the issues at Boundary Park, from stories of supporters being banned from the stadium for protesting the ownership, to Paul Scholes walking out after being told to leave out certain players. And there is perhaps no team that have prompted as many requests in the comment section of my videos asking for me to make a documentary about them for such a prolonged period of time. After weeks looking into the situation at Oldham Athletic, I now understand why that was the case. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Greater Manchester, far from the riches of Sheikh Mansour and the Glazers, the glamour of Old Trafford and the Etihad, and the success of Manchester City and Manchester United. To the town of Oldham, which was once a boom town during the Industrial Revolution, but is now among the most deprived towns in England, as we take a look at a football club that has been on an equally chaotic journey over an even shorter period of time in a story which is littered with tales that must surely be seen in order to be believed. In the summer of 2017, things were looking pretty bleak at Oldham Athletic. Following their glory years under Joe Royal, in which the club not only spent two seasons in the Premier League, but also reached a League Cup final and an FA Cup semi-final, the Latics had endured a brief and painful period of decline, followed by a lifeless and incredibly lengthy era of stagnation. Oldham were relegated from the First Division in 1997, dropping into English football's third tier, and over the next 20 years, taking us all the way to the apocal summer of 2017, the club from Greater Manchester didn't taste a single promotion or relegation. Oldham spent so long in what became League One that they faced teams as varied in stature as Manchester City and Rushton and Diamonds as divisional rivals without changing leagues once themselves. There had been hope of a revival in 2001 when the club was acquired by Oxford-based businessman Chris Moore, who opened up his checkbook with promotion in mind. In Moore's second season, following further investment and the appointment of Ian Dowie as first-team boss, Oldham finished just four points off automatic promotion before falling to Queen's Park Rangers in the playoff semi-finals. It seemed as though the club was heading in the right direction, but at that point, Moore seemingly lost interest, withdrew his funding and put the club up for sale. This left Oldham in a perilous financial situation, since Moore left behind a large amount of debt and a once promising but now decimated first-team squad following a fire sale. 
Moore's software firm, which was the source of his wealth, went into administration in 2006, and in 2013, he was fined £100,000 and jailed for 30 months after being convicted of several fraud offences. Oldham weren't the only football league team in financial disarray in the early 2000s, following the collapse of ITV Digital, but their crisis was heightened by Moore's exodus. Threatened with liquidation and the club going out of business at the 11th hour, Oldham are granted a temporary reprieve by two London businessmen who made a cash injection of £200,000 into the club. The Latics still went into administration, but the club lived to fight another day. And following a famous win against Manchester City in the third round of the FA Cup, Simon Blitz, Simon Corney and Danny Gazal completed their takeover of the club in June 2005. Three English-born businessmen who had made their fortunes in the mobile phone and real estate sectors in America, they were reported to have invested £5.8 million into Oldham, most of that being spent on Boundary Park, by the time the dust settled. At their first press conference, Blitz promised that he was in it for the long haul, and he was telling the truth. Blitz, Corney and Gazal stabilised the club and kept them in League One, but after reaching the playoffs in the 2006-07 season, Oldham began to regress once again. Between the 2009-10 and 2016-17 seasons, for eight successive campaigns, Oldham didn't finish in the top half of the League One table on a single occasion. There was a growing malcontent at Boundary Park and a feeling that a fresh impetus at a team that had become wedded to League One was badly required. That change appeared to have arrived in the summer of 2017 when, with rumours abound of an impending takeover, Oldham suddenly adopted a very different approach in the transfer market. Brighton loanee Rob Hunt was signed for a fee which reportedly made in the club's record signing since their Premier League days. Meanwhile, a string of players arrived on loan and on free transfers, supposedly on eye-watering salaries by League One standards. Curaçao international Javaro Nepomuceno arrived from Portuguese Premier League side Maritimo. Haitian international Johnny Placid was brought in from Jangon in League One along with some more familiar faces, such as former Latic Craig Davies, who returned to Boundary Park, promising Irish youth team international Jack Byrne, who joined on loan from Wigan Athletic, and veteran centre-forward Ishmael Miller, who previously played in the Premier League for both West Brom and Manchester City. Oldham's biggest signing, though, at least from a financial point of view, was Netherlands youth team international Quincy Menek, formerly of Ajax, who joined on loan from Nantes in League One. It was reported that Meneg was being paid £12,000 a week at Oldham for the duration of his loan, a salary which was about five times that of most Oldham players and put him comfortably among the highest earners in the division. The takeover of Oldham Athletic was completed in January 2018, midway through the 2017-18 season as Abdallah Lemzegam was unveiled to and applauded by supporters at Boundary Park prior to a game against Plymouth Argyle. Oldham lost the game 2-1, and despite the hefty summer investment and a whopping further nine January arrivals, that defeat left the club in the League One relegation zone, having played more games than almost everyone else around them. New owner Abdallah, whose arrival was welcomed following two decades of stagnation, did not accept any responsibility for Oldham's struggles up to that point. Whilst the previous regime claimed that their lucrative summer business had only been carried out following assurances from the new owners, Abdallah claimed that he had nothing to do with it, and that the situation that he inherited at Boundary Park was a total mess. Some found that a little bit hard to believe, given the fact that Oldham's former regime had been extremely conservative throughout their ownership of the club, and had very rarely signed players from overseas. Signing relatively obscure players from overseas, on the other hand, was said to be a key part of Newman Abdallah Lemzegam's strategy at Oldham. Lemzegam is a Moroccan football agent who runs an agency called Sport2 JLT, which is headquartered in Dubai, where Lemzegam lives. Lemzegam's agency is best known for overseeing the recruitment of big-name players, often in the latter stages of their careers, by football clubs based in the Middle East with former clients of his, including the likes of Afonso Alves, Sully Montari, Alvaro Negredo, Harry Kuehl, and Samuel Eto'o. These lucrative deals can net big profits for middlemen, but they're not exactly reminiscent of the type of recruitment that is synonymous with League One teams. 
Lemsergam supposedly felt that if he owned a football club, he would be able to use his contacts and networks to bring in players from overseas for modest fees, showcase their talents within the English game, shift them on for significant profit, while strengthening the club itself at the same time. It is not wholly dissimilar to the extraordinarily successful transfer strategy that has been adopted by Brentford under Matthew Benham, except for the rather crucial fact that Brentford's recruitment was based on comprehensive scouting networks and some of the most thorough data analysis anywhere outside of Champions League football. Meanwhile, Abdallah's recruitment seemingly would be a bit more of a vibe. The amount of players who arrived at Boundary Park over the next few seasons, whether that be on loan, on permanent deals, or just on trial, was absolutely unbelievable. Former members of staff tell tales of managers not being able to keep up with all of the new names, kit men being equally confused, and existing players utterly bemused. Oldham brought in a handful of decent players, though most found life in Greater Manchester and the style of playing League One to be a bit of a culture shock, but they also signed an absolute cacophony of drivel. Take Erko Vera, for example, who was signed by Oldham in the summer of 2019, having previously played in Japan, Romania, and even in La Liga for Athletic Bilbao. The day after he signed for the club, Vera scored just one minute into his Oldham debut. He failed to score in any of his next seven appearances before being released, re-signed by the club the following season, where he scored once again in five appearances. He is now a reality TV star back in Bilbao. The decision to sign Vera, not once but twice, despite the fact that he appeared to be hopeless at football, was one made by Mohamed Lemzagam, Abdallah's brother, who was appointed by Abdallah as Oldham's sporting director. Mohamed has a coaching badge from UEFA and briefly played third tier football in France, but cynics have suggested that maybe he is totally unqualified and just got the job because his brother owns the club. What Abdallah actually owns is another issue of some contention, would you believe it? While Simon Blitz and Danny Gazal stepped back from their management of the club in 2010, leaving it to Simon Corney, who sold Oldham to Lemsergam in January 2018, Boundary Park is still said to be owned by Brass Bank Limited, which is itself owned by Simon Blitz and Danny Gazal. Essentially, Abdallah doesn't own the ground, two of the former owners do, and even in Oldham's 2018 accounts, the club owed Brass Bank a mortgage worth around £5 million, as well as owing £335,000 to an unknown company named Nekaku. Oldham have since had numerous stadium-related disputes, close stands, and standoffs between the new and old owners. Meanwhile, Boundary Park itself, which is 118 years old, is in need of further renovations. A consistent theme of Abdallah's ownership has been accusations of interference when it comes to team selection and first team management. Lemsergam strongly denies all of these allegations, but they are numerous and quite difficult to ignore. What is impossible to deny for an absolute fact is that Oldham have burnt three managers unlike any other team in the Football League. And believe me when I say that, on that front, there is some stiff competition. Since the start of 2015, just seven years ago, Oldham have sacked 16 managers, none of whom have managed to make it to the milestone of just 50 games in charge of the club. Even Watford cannot rival either of those statistics. In Abdallah's first season in charge of Oldham, the club's uninterrupted 21-year stay in the third tier of English football came to an end, but not in the way in which he would have hoped. In only Abdallah's second month in Greater Manchester, players were already reportedly getting paid late, something that would become a bit of a theme of his ownership. Although the club's wage bill doubled over the course of the 2017-18 season, putting it among the largest in League One, failure to win any of their last eight games saw Oldham get relegated, finishing one point behind local rivals Rochdale. Over the summer, whilst he was on holiday, manager Richie Wellens received a text message to say that he had been sacked. Abdallah's first appointment as Oldham boss, tasked with replacing Wellens and taking Oldham back up again, was Frankie Bunn. Like Wellens, Bunn was a former Oldham player, famously having scored a double hat-trick for the club in the League Cup, which remains a record for the most goals ever scored in a single League Cup fixture. Earlier this season, Oldham went for another League Cup record, the heaviest ever defeat, but 
however humiliating, a 7-0 thrashing at the hands of Brentford wasn't quite bad enough to take the crown. When Oldham lost that game, just four months ago, they were already on their fifth manager since Frankie Bunn. That is the level of turmoil at the club. One of those managers was Manchester United legend Paul Scholes, a boyhood Oldham Athletic fan, who had often talked of his desire to maybe one day join the club. Scholes ended up walking out after just seven games, only one of which he won, and was scathing in his criticism of how the club was being run when he walked out. Unlike a lot of managers who might be employed at League Two level, Scholes didn't need the money, and he didn't need the hassle, hence why his departure came even quicker than most and was of his own making. One of the great disappointments among Oldham fans in recent years, and believe me, it is a long list, is the number of major figures with close ties to the club who have been employed by Lemsigam since 2018, seemingly able to offer a great deal to help the club and their players whilst actually caring deeply about Oldham's success, only for those opportunities to be wasted by false promises, wretched mismanagement, or simply them getting the sack. Oldham have made a bit of a habit in recent years of freezing out players who are on big contracts, allegedly attempting to treat them as poorly as possible in the hope that they will walk out without the club having to pay them. Former club captain Anthony Gerrard was among the most high-profile such examples, enjoying a mixed legacy among Oldham fans following his time at the club. With the club initially attempting to sack Gerrard for comments that he had made on social media and when that didn't work, they were able to terminate his contract due to messages that he had sent privately on WhatsApp. Gerard is another former Latic who has been very vocal in his criticism of the way in which Oldham has been run, and Abdallah Lemzigam in particular. Gerard has not only made light of some of the players that Abdallah brought to Boundary Park, he even accused the owners of putting a plant in the Oldham Athletic dressing room, claiming to have seen the supposed player listening into conversations whilst almost never playing any actual football in training, and on the one occasion in which he did so, Gerard claims, it was evident that he had never played football at anything like a professional standard before. Oldham later replaced Gerard with another experienced centre-back, namely David Wheater, who had previously played in the Premier League for both Middlesbrough and Bolton Wanderers. Naturally, Wheater was one of the higher earners at Oldham in League 2, and when the COVID-19 pandemic saw all football matches suspended in England as club captain, he was tasked with negotiating the Oldham players' COVID contracts for the duration of football suspension. According to reports, Abdallah initially offered to furlough Oldham's players and then top up their contracts to 80% of what they would usually be paid, before reversing this decision and saying that they would only receive standard furlough payments. Under the UK furlough scheme, the government would pay 80% of an employee's salary up to £2,500 a month. Of course, some Oldham players earned a fair bit more than £2,500 a month, meaning that for someone like Wheata, he would actually be looking at a 70% salary reduction. On the advice of the PFA, he declined that offer, digging in his heels over the terms that he had been offered. Subsequently, he never played for the club again. This was a particularly frustrating situation for Oldham fans because during the 2020-21 season in which Wheater was frozen out, Oldham had one of the best attacking records in the division whilst also shipping by far the most goals at the opposite end. The 72 goals that Oldham scored that season was bettered only by one goal and only by Cambridge United, who finished in second place. Yet, the 81 goals that they conceded saw the club finish 18th. It seemed patently obvious to most Oldham fans that the club was crying out for an experienced and competent centre-back to come in at the heart of their defence and steady the ship. But not only did Oldham only sign two wingers and sell a centre-forward in the January transfer window, they had a vastly experienced former Premier League centre-back training with their youth team. What's more, the same day that the furlough scheme ended, manager Dino Marmria was sacked. The pandemic prevented Oldham fans from protesting that season, but once football returned, a typically very reasonable and measured fan base was visibly angered, staging a number of protests against the Lemsigams. 
Abdallah responded by banning a number of Oldham supporters from attending games, including one from the Supporters' Trust, which received national press attention, and he even banned all supporters from buying tickets to two of Oldham's home games in September 2021, when some of the most vociferous protests had begun in an effort to dampen them down. It's not just Oldham fans, players, and managers that Abdallah has got on the wrong side of, though. He has also obliterated many of the club's commercial deals. Most of the companies that sponsor Oldham are run by supporters with medium-sized businesses who are looking to help out the club as much as seeking to advertise their own companies when they agree upon a sponsorship deal. However, numerous scandals that have engulfed the club, dwindling crowds, and Abdallah's prickly approach to supporters has left many deciding to sever their ties with the Latics in their current state. Oldham Vending Services, who became Oldham's primary front of shirt sponsors in September 2020, terminated their sponsorship of the club in March of 2021, publicly labelling the club as a disgrace. This spate of sponsorship withdrawals led to Oldham's deeply unpopular longtime director, Barry Owen, resigning in a rare bit of good news for fans, which was met with this rather frosty club statement announcing his decision. The most infamous moment of Owen's time at Oldham was perhaps a meeting with supporters when he asked supporters not to interrupt him before stating, rather arrogantly, they all say that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, only to be interrupted by a fan who commented, yeah, and you've got F all, which was greeted with raucous applause. Or how about the time when he stated that Nicky Maynard hadn't ripped up any trees at Mansfield a week before Maynard scored a hat-trick for Mansfield against Oldham. Oldham, who drew one all with Chelsea at Stamford Bridge on the opening weekend of the Premier League back in 1992, are now the worst-ranked team in the entire Football League. At the time of this recording, the Latics are seven points from safety, and they have now gone eight games without tasting a win. As per the last set of accounts, Oldham were around £4.5 million in debt, more than £3 million of which was due to be repaid within the next 12 months. And the club was still losing more than £5 million a season, so roughly £100,000 a week. Though the tide of those losses is believed to have been stemmed somewhat this season. In 2021, Oldham were one of 191 companies, including six football clubs, to be publicly shamed by the UK government for paying their employees less than minimum wage. You know it's bad when this lot are shaming you. Oldham's general staff turnover could rival their managerial revolving door and their scattergun approach in the transfer market, with several former members of staff having taken the club to employment tribunals. With all of that being said, there has been some good news for Oldham Athletic fans in recent weeks. On January 25th, John Sheridan put pen to paper on a six-month deal, sealing his return to Boundary Park. And on January 11th, Abdallah Lemzegam wrote a statement on the club's official website, declaring that he was ready to sell and was in talks with potential buyers. Given Sheridan's immense popularity among Oldham fans and his reputation for performing miracles, along with Abdallah and his brother's immense unpopularity and reputation for, you know, being absolutely useless at everything, both of these stories came as rare pieces of good news for Oldham fans. But the overall complexion is still fairly grim. Oldham's balance sheet and league standing means that, not for the first time, there are genuine concerns surrounding the team's continued existence, particularly if they were unable to perform an almost 1992-93 style great escape. Whilst Abdallah has finally said that he is willing to sell the club, some fear that it may be a cynical ploy to try and dampen down protests for the rest of the campaign. And even if he is serious, his £6 million asking price appears to be somewhat unrealistic. As a Hull City fan, whose club was supposedly up for sale for more than eight years with a totally unrealistic asking price, I can testify that even once negotiations become more reasonable, these things can take an awful lot of time. In the case of Oldham, that process is even more complicated because Abdallah owns so few of the club's assets. Any potential buyer would likely be dealing with three parties, rather than one, assuming that they also wanted to acquire the club's stadium and the intellectual property of their badge. In all likelihood, Oldham will be a non-league team next season. Any new owner would be taking on a loss-making asset, which 
is on the verge of losing an enormous chunk of its revenue and dropping into a league which is notoriously difficult to get out of and where several teams are now seemingly willing to lose millions of pounds in pursuit of promotion to the Football League. It is a tough sell, and only a much more modest valuation is likely to interest anyone who isn't both extremely wealthy and extremely passionate about Oldham Athletic. You could hardly wish to find a greater example of the financial inequalities in football in the 21st century than the case of Greater Manchester and Lancashire. The region is home to two of the wealthiest football clubs on the planet. Between them, Manchester City and Manchester United have spent almost £3 billion on transfers alone over the past 10 years. Manchester City spent £100 million on just one player last summer. Manchester United spent £80 million on a centre-back in 2019. Meanwhile, Bury and Macclesfield Town fans have been left without a club to support in the last few years. The likes of Wigan Athletic and Bolton Wanderers have both faced perilous financial predicaments, and Oldham are now hurtling towards the non-league game with a deeply uncertain future all of their own. It isn't just in the northwest of England, wretched owners, financial problems, and an unsustainable gulf between the Premier League and the EFL is a long-running trend within the English game, and it is one which is only getting worse. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7. You can also find me on social media on either Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.